Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Alice Bryant, and John Russell. Later, we will present the next part in our series on America's national parks. But first, the new coronavirus has hit South Africa harder than any other African nation. So far, the country has reported more than 23,000 cases of COVID-19 and more than 480 deaths. But the disease is also affecting people's mental health as they deal with social distancing and the economic impact of the virus. 60-year-old Wendy Jones has not been able to work for 15 years because of severe mental health problems. She is also not permitted to drive. With the healthcare system centered on the COVID-19 outbreak, getting the right treatments has become more difficult for her. I personally feel more anxious. I get really worried. And where, who do I go to? Am I on the right medication? Should my medication be increased? I don't know these things. I need somebody to tell me. Your trust in the medical system as it is, it should be complete, it should be absolute, but it isn't. Masutani Majaji is the leader for information and awareness at South Africa's Federation for Mental Health. She says most patients are going untreated. While clinics and hospitals are open, very few of them still pay attention to current mental health care users during this time. And also there is no screening for mental health during COVID-19 screening and testing. Kagisho Marangane is a member of South Africa's Society of Psychiatrists. He says mental health care was poor even before the coronavirus crisis. Now we are in a pandemic and you're finding yourself sort of on the back foot with an already fragile system and not knowing how to go about fixing it, he said. Matsutani Majaji agrees. She said, in South Africa, only 5% of the national health budget goes toward mental health services. She added that in low- and middle-income countries like South Africa, between 76 and 85% of people with mental illness receive no treatment. South Africa's mental health workers worry about what will happen after the pandemic. The country has been through similar health crises before, and the effects are lasting, Kagisho Marunganye said. There will be some long-lasting effects on, your, on, the, on the psyche and the mental health state of, of, of the population, based on what has happened before. We've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had Ebola, and all of these have required some sort of uh, lockdown or some sort of quarantine to take place. Experts worry that this time, South Africa's struggling mental health care system will fall even more behind in meeting the needs of patients. American technology companies are looking ahead to the future of office work after the coronavirus crisis. Some are considering whether to permit employees to keep working from home, as most have been required to do for the past few months. 
companies including Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and Twitter were among the first to send their employees home as the coronavirus spread to the United States. Now, some of their employees might never go back. The companies are studying ways to give their highly valued employees what they want. They are seeking to use their own technology to make remote work easier. They are also looking to hire new workers who live outside of big cities. Silicon Valley has long operated by establishing large work centers in major cities to appeal to high-quality workers. But the lasting effects of the pandemic could change that. Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg recently discussed the issue of full-time remote work in a company meeting broadcast live on his Facebook page. He said a company survey had found that about 20% of workers were extremely or very interested in moving to full-time remote work after virus-related restrictions are lifted. Another 20% said they were somewhat interested in the possibility. The largest group favored a work situation including both remote and in-office work. In the future, Zuckerberg said, up to half of Facebook's workers could be working remotely. But he noted that the changes are likely years away. We want to make sure we move forward in a measured way, Zuckerberg said at the meeting. For now, employees at Facebook, Google, Twitter, and others have been given permission to work remotely through the rest of the year. Microsoft has told its employees they can work from home until October. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey recently announced the company plans to permit some employees to work from home permanently. Some of the company's new U.S.-based job listings give the choice for workers to either be based in one of several major cities or work remotely full-time from anywhere. Andy Challenger is a vice president at the private employment company Challenger Gray and Christmas. He told the Associated Press that companies have gotten the chance to see the benefits of having employees work from home. Many companies are learning that their workers are just as or even more productive working from home, he said. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella also spoke about the issue at a recent developer conference. Every organization will increasingly need the ability, at a moment's notice, to remote everything from manufacturing to sales to customer support, he said. Microsoft's chief technology officer, Kevin Scott, had already been working a lot from home before the virus hit. He is based in Silicon Valley, while the rest of the leadership team is mostly based in Redmond, Washington. Scott said the experience of the last few months had sped up the process of employees trying to find the best methods and technology to successfully work from home. He added that the process requires learning the culture of keeping in touch with co-workers remotely. That is getting so much better so quickly, he said. I don't think I'm going to be commuting nearly as frequently as I was before. 
I'm Brian Lynn. In Japan, many small medical centers are at risk of going out of business as a result of the coronavirus crisis. Even as the government eases COVID-19 restrictions, people continue to avoid the clinics in fear they might catch the disease there. Now, clinic owners are asking the government for help. Toshihiko Yamazaki operates a clinic in the city of Urawa, north of Tokyo. He said clinics in the residential and office areas seem to be having a difficult time. Even if the state of emergency is lifted, patients won't be able to return as long as there is a risk of infection, he said. Yamazaki has seven employees. His clinic has gotten through the crisis better than most because it is close to a major train station. Still, in April, revenue was down 17%. Japan had about 16,600 coronavirus infections and around 850 deaths. It has mostly contained the virus without heavy restrictions on travel and business. Citizens mostly have obeyed the government's call for an 80% cut to social interactions. Clinic visits for usual health care have decreased as a result. An industry organization, the Tokyo Medical Practitioner Association, surveyed 1,200 clinics in the capital. It says more than 90% of them suffered revenue loss in April. The Japan Federation of Insurance Medical Associations carried out a similar survey nationwide. It found that more than 80% of 2,900 clinics also saw revenue loss in April. Some of the business went to the Internet, where doctors can provide telehealth services. But most doctors get only about half as much money as they would receive for in-person visits. Experts also predict a decrease of about $4.6 billion dollars in hospital revenues this year. Teaching hospitals have asked the government for financial aid. And medical and hospital groups are urging Japan's health ministry to redirect aid for community health programs to small medical centers. Health ministry official Kazuho Taguchi said the ministry was taking the issue seriously. Non-virus services must be continued, he added, saying the ministry was holding hearings on ways to deal with the problem of fewer patients. Toshio Nakagawa is vice president of the Japan Medical Association. He points out that as revenue decreases, doctors may reconsider plans to buy equipment and hire workers. That, he says, could lead to a drop in the quality of medical care. I'm Alice Bryant. In the film A League of Their Own, actor Tom Hanks plays the coach of an American baseball team. He oversees an all-female team called the Rockford Peaches. In one famous scene at a game, Hanks gets angry at one of the players. 
she begins to cry. He then says the following words. There's no crying! There's no crying in baseball! That movie line has also been in the news recently. In March, while visiting Australia, Hanks tested positive for the new coronavirus. A short time later, the actor wrote on Twitter, Remember, despite all the current events, there is no crying in baseball. Today on Everyday Grammar, we will explore how this famous line can teach you about the link between grammar and pronunciation, the ways in which words are spoken. The word compound suggests two words that, together, have one meaning. The two words have become a kind of phrase or expression that acts like a noun. Often, two nouns make up a compound. For example, the nouns book and shelf can be combined to make the compound noun bookshelf. Every student fears another kind of compound noun, a report card. In writing, compounds sometimes have a space between the two words, sometimes they do not. At times, a compound noun is based on an adjective and a noun. Hot dogs are a popular food sold at baseball games in the U.S. The word hot is an adjective, and dog is a noun. Together, they make the compound noun hot dog. You might be asking yourself what the link is between compounds and speaking. The idea is this. In speaking, Americans usually stress the first word in a compound. They say the first word louder or longer to show its importance. At times, stress could also mean saying something with a higher pitch in your voice. Listen to some of the words from earlier in our report. Bookshelf Report card Hot dog However, when an adjective goes before a noun, and the two words do not make a compound, then the stress should go on the noun, the second word. So, if the adjective good goes before the noun job, then the stress goes on job. This is because good job is not a compound noun. It is just an adjective and a noun. Here are two examples. He did a good job. Good job. In the book Mastering the American Accent, Lisa Mojson writes how stress helps show a difference in meaning between a compound noun and an adjective plus noun group that is not a compound. Here are two examples. I went to the White House. I went to the White House. The first statement uses a compound noun. White House, the official home of the U.S. president. The second statement uses an adjective and noun that do not make up a compound. White House. Did you hear how the stress was different in the two statements? Think back to the words Tom Hanks said at the beginning of our report. There's no crying! There's no crying in baseball! Did you hear how Hanks said baseball? Baseball is a compound noun made of the words base and ball. In baseball, the batter is supposed to run toward first base after he or she hits the ball. You could say that the batter's attention is on getting to the first base. Likewise, when you pronounce compound nouns, your attention should be placed on the first word 
or first part of the word. The next time you are watching an American film, try to listen for how the actors put stress on different words. Try to listen for examples of compound nouns. Try using word stress in the way we talked about today. With time, your speaking will become clearer and more understandable to native speakers. And remember, there is no crying in baseball. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. The Verdi National Park is over 100 years old. In 1906, then-President Theodore Roosevelt signed a bill creating the park. Mesa Verde offers visitors a look into the lives of the ancestral Pueblo people, who lived in the area between 700 and 1,400 years ago. The National Park protects almost 5,000 archaeological sites. They are some of the best preserved archaeological areas in the country. The term Mesa Verde is Spanish for green table. Early Spanish explorers gave the name to the area. In geology, a mesa is a flat-topped highland with steep sides. Mesa Verde is not actually a mesa. It is a cuesta, a term used to describe a hill with a sharp drop on one side and a soft, gentle slope on the other. A more correct name for the national park, then, would be Cuesta Verde. The gently sloping side of Mesa Verde was important in the formation of the 600 cliff dwellings within the park. Cliff dwellings are living areas that were set up in caves, the large open areas in the side of the cliff. Mesa Verde rises more than 540 meters above the ground. Visitors can drive to the top of the hill on a winding mountain road. In the distance are the flatlands and mountains of an area called the Four Corners. That is where the western states of Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona meet. Some of the ruins in the Four Corners area are from the earliest people who lived there. They were hunters and gatherers, now known as basket makers. The basket makers lived in simple caves. The first evidence that ancient people had moved to Mesa Verde is from about 1,500 years ago. Those people lived in pit houses, large holes in the ground with wood and mud covering the top. In the 8th century, the early Pueblo people began building square structures of large connected rooms, or pueblos, above ground. More than 300 years later, they climbed down the canyon walls and began building cliff dwellings. Today, visitors to Mesa Verde National Park can see some of the remains 
of all four kinds of settlements. Visitors are able to explore several of Mesa Verde's renowned cliff dwellings. Many of them take several hours to reach by foot. Signs along some of the paths point to trees and plants used by the ancestral Puebloan people. Visitors will also find the juniper and pinyon pine trees that make Mesa Verde green. Cliff Palace is the largest cliff dwelling in Mesa Verde and North America. It has 150 rooms. It is not easy to get to Cliff Palace. Visitors must climb down into the canyon on a narrow path with many steps. They must also climb down several ladders. But the trip is well worth the effort. Visitors can examine this beautiful structure made of stone and clay. Spruce Tree House is the third largest cliff dwelling in Mesa Verde. It has 114 rooms. It also has eight underground rooms called kivas. Pueblo Indian men gathered in the kivas for ceremonies. Mesa Verde National Park occupies 21,000 hectares of land in Montezuma County, Colorado. About 500,000 people visit the park each year. Archaeologists working in Mesa Verde have recovered many objects that the ancient Pueblo people used, including tools and jewelry. Many of the objects can be seen in the visitor's center. However, human remains or any object from a burial area may not be touched or shown. This is to respect the wishes of the modern Puebloan people who live in the area today. Mesa Verde has been recognized as a special place. The United Nations named it as one of the first World Heritage Sites in 1978. Today's Pueblo Indians consider Mesa Verde a sacred place. And for visitors from around the world, it remains a place of mystery and beauty. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.